<laughs> Only if you don't mind. Staffing is short, 
just be aware of that. Uh, sometimes supporting a database is a lot easier than having to support a, a large cluster. And then site licensing is sometimes um, you're in a situation where you're in a corporation that already owns a site license to something like Oracle. Sometimes then it does make sense instead of trying to spend a lot more resources to build a, a new OSQL solution. Um, now there are a lot of cases where, where no OSQL solution makes a lot of sense. You have a case of size, something in the petabytes, or data set width, something with you know, thousands of columns. Um, using a database can be a little bit unwieldy. Uh, if you have unstructured or document-oriented data, so if you're calling the internet, or if you have a lot of documents um, that you're dealing with, then trying to you know, jam binaries into a, a database table doesn't always work very well. If data is easily denormalized or very flat, like a key value kind of lookup, yeah, that's very useful. If you have uh, high write loads, um, if you're dealing with a lot of writes, but you don't necessarily need to have transaction integrity, it can be very useful. Uh, or a heavy read load, that's going to exceed the RAM of a computer. So if you have a read load that needs is very latency sensitive, so you need to return it in microseconds or milliseconds, and uh, you know the data doesn't fit entirely in RAM, you want to partition it across multiple machines, then a, a NoSQL solution can be really useful for that. Uh, or if you need high availability of write operations without necessarily requiring the, the transaction isolation, um, then you can basically do sort of asynchronous sort of a dirty write and say, well, as long as at least this number of nodes gets it, I'm happy. I'm just going to keep moving on. Um, if you need the ability to control the quorum on a reader or write, so, you know, I want to read data and whatever node returns data first, I'll take it, you know, uh, whether, it, whether or not it's stale, or I need a minimum of you know, two nodes return to me before I will accept that data. You can specify that with a lot of these uh, clients. And then sometimes cost restrictions. If you have, you know, presented with a particular business problem, and they say, well, we need to do this. And you say, well, it's going to, if we use a commercial solution or use something like a database, it's going to cost this. And a lot of times, uh, a NoSQL uh, solution can help you there. Um, so, Next thing I'll do is walk through some of the more popular systems that are uh, are used out there, and then also talk up a little bit about how they're used in their applications. So, um, first, I want to cover is Cassandra. Uh, it's a system that we use pretty extensively. It's a key value data store that provides eventual consistency. And uh, when you write something, you can specify how many nodes you want to accept that data, and it's not guaranteed. It doesn't necessarily lock all the nodes until all the updates are completed. It lets you specify how many nodes you want to receive the update before it moves on. Uh, it allows some control to write and read consistency. You can say, well, you know, hey, return me this data, but I, I want to wait for two nodes to, con to, to confirm it before I uh, accept it. There's structured data for values using the column family and the columns and super columns. Uh, it's highly available, so there's no single point of failure. Things are constructed in a, in a dynamic sort of ring, which uh, they, the peers talk to uh, one another using a protocol called gossip. Uh, you have controls over replicas and their geometry, so you can say, well, I want you know, to have two racks, and I want to replicate the data evenly between the two racks so that there's always a copy in one rack or the other. And this is a case where you have a data center. Like in our, in our case, we have racks that have different power supplies. So if you lose a power supply, like a power strip, and you lose an entire rack, you don't want your service to go down. So you say, well, I want to make sure that I always have at least one replica in each of these racks. So if, you know, People trip over cables, data center employees pull out things, that stuff happens. Um, you know, networks go down, what, what have you. Um, so that your service can continue, no one really notices. Um, it's really useful in situations with high read and write volume of denormalized data, so key value things again. Um, and this is very similar to uh, a system called Dynamo uh, and another system called Voldemort, um, which you may have heard of. Uh, Tokyo Cabinet is uh, another key value store. It's sort of in the vein of, of DBM or GDBM, GDBM and uh, Berkeley DB. And it's more of designed as a single machine database. Uh, it does give you some control over hashes, features, the sort of uh, storage format on the disk. Extremely high performance in reads and writes. It also has a very friendly license for those of you who have tried to do something commercial with Berkeley DB. It can be a little bit un unfriendly sometimes. Uh, it has a very friendly license. Um, there's actually a new version called the Kyoto Cabinet that's coming out soon. Um, there's not really features. This isn't really designed as a distributed system. There's not a lot of features for replication or distribution, redundancy, things like that. But it's great if you're just trying to do something on a single machine and uh, if you're just doing like a local data store um, without the need for replication. 
Uh, another system out there is called Redis. This is also an in, this is an in-memory key value store, uh, sort of similar to memcached, but also allows some other features like snapshotting of data so you can do like a point in time recovery. Uh, it supports master-slave replication. Uh, so structured data, very similar to Sandy, not just you know key and blob. Uh, you can have sort of columns in there. Uh, because it's all in memory, the reads and writes are all very fast, but it is volatile. So it is, you know, the data is, is uh, gone. But if you're if you're doing applications where you have a very high read throughput and you can deal with like a single master, lots of uh, lots of readers, uh, without strict data consistency, it's, it can be very good. Uh, there's another one there called CouchDB, and this is a document-oriented data store. So what you do there is you store a JSON document using a unique document ID. So I'm going to put document one two three into this data store, and it's just this JSON blob with a bunch of uh, of columns and uh, and rows and and even just sort of data structures in there. Uh, and then you can retrieve it later by that doc ID. Now, in the background, it also runs another uh, Erlang process, which is indexing that data so that you can run searches against that data. It does support asset semantics, um, but it doesn't have like a strict uh, tabular structure like a SQL database might. Uh, and then it layers SQL-like semantics on top of that those JSON documents using these views. And these views are generated with this background uh, Erlang process. So that later, you, once you store a document in there, you can query and basically search through your document store um, using SQL-like semantics. It's very, very close. Um, because of Erlang's core, it, it supports very heavy parallelism, and Erlang's you know, strength is concurrency. And so it's really great at that. And, and if you're storing, indexing, and replicating documents, it's, it's a really great data store. So if you're storing binaries like images, or you might just be storing large, I don't know, PDF files, you can, you can just jam them into this thing, and then you can search search them, um, and then you can fetch them by ID, and you don't need to necessarily worry about maintaining uh, a single node since it's, there's no real single point of failure. Uh, another system out there is, is Hive, which is part of the Hadoop project. This provides a SQL-like language on top of Hadoop's MapReduce system. Um, it inherits, by, by being part of Hadoop, it inherits a lot of the, the scaling and redundancy features of HDFS. Uh, which is Hadoop's distributed file system um, that lets you work with very large data sets. Uh, it supports custom partitioning and indexing of data, so you can say, you know, I'm going to partition it by a customer ID or, a, you know, some, some other ID by name, and you, and you can do that to improve performance. It does support joins across data sets, which is one of the things that a lot of these uh, NoSQL systems don't really support, is joins across multiple data sets. Uh, you can implement um, custom serializers that basically can give you any customized backing store. It might be a text file or some proprietary binary format. And it's really useful for building data warehouses out of some structured data that you may have laying around, and then making it more accessible and queryable to uh, users that are used to SQL syntax and may not be you know, developers. Okay. So um, that was just sort of a, a list of some of the more popular OSQL systems out there. So what I wanted to go into now was talking about some examples and case studies, and some of it from our own experience, and some of it from just talking to other uh, other people out there. So uh, first is Cassandra. We use Cassandra um, to store data about users. Uh, we get hundreds of millions of unique user IDs per day, and uh, we're in the advertising business, so we store data about users. About their, you know, everyone gets an anonymous cookie. Um, and we store information about what we know about that user. Sometimes it's from our clients saying, hey, you know, this user visited my client's website. I'm trying to ad advertise to people that have visited this website. So store this information about this user saying, hey, they visited, you know, uh, I don't know, ESPN.com. I want to show my ad when they go to other sites. So we store information on behalf of our clients who want to store some sort of information, whether it be behavioral or demographic or what have you. Uh, and so we see hundreds of millions of unique users every day, and we're asked to store this data. So we have hundreds of Cassandra nodes that are basically receiving this data, um, and it is uh, sensitive to latency because the way we get this data is people dropping like uh, tracking pixels on sites. You may see like a one by one invisible GIF on sites, and there may be some garbage appended to it. It's basically encoded information, telling some information about you, um, which we're paid to then try and find you when you visit other sites. So that encoded information comes to us and it says, hey, this user really likes basketball. Um, and so then we store it, but we don't want to hang publisher pages or, you know, someone opening up Firebug would say, hey, this thing's taking forever to load. Why is it always this, this 
stupid open XFIX pixels taking forever. So what we do is we basically uh, leverage the eventual consistency of the standard saying, okay, well, as long as one node gets the update, we're going to do a best effort. If, we ha if the node happens to die in the, the, the fraction of time between when we receive the update and when it gets flushed to all the other nodes, then that's fine. We can live with it because it's a best effort kind of service. Uh, it's also very sensitive to to a read, latency sensitive for reads. And that's because on the flip side, when we're making the decision to serve an ad, we really have a, a slim time budget to work with, less than 100 milliseconds to decide which ad we're going to show. So when a, when a user comes in and, and we consider an ad for them, we look up their user ID, we see what, what is all the data that we have available for that user ID. We look at all the ads that are candidates for the system, and we say, okay, these people are targeting basketball users, so let's you know consider those ads. So because of that, we basically give Sander a time budget, and if it if it expires its time budget, we give up and say, okay, we're just not going to consider any of these ads here that are targeted, we're just going to fall back to some other ads. Um, so because of that, we can't necessarily deal with any locking. We basically have to try our best and then give up if we run out of time. Um, data is partitioned by user ID. You know, this allows us to spread up, you know, so a particular group of nodes may have, you know, a uh, few million users, another group of nodes may have another few million, few million users, and we just constantly are partitioning and moving data around as the user base grows. There's multiple replicas to handle read load, so you know, if a user is very active or a group of users is very active, we can, we can handle the read load. Um, and then again, it's the best effort read. Some of the other users out there, Cassandra or Twitter, which are using it for to store tweets. Um, so when you write a, a tweet, it gets stored, it gets indexed by your user ID, and they can run other things against it. Uh, Dig also uses Cassandra. Uh, they use a pretty, a pretty new version of it um, with some of the custom patches that they've added for vector clocks, basically atomic counters. Um, Redis is another uh, system, and we use Redis by flattening MySQL uh, old TP data into more a fast localized sort of in-memory data store. So you can take like a structured data, you know, in our database we may have accounts, and underneath accounts you have different objects like orders and line items, ads, sites. These are things that our users are setting up using our, our, user, interf our user interface. And they create these objects and they expect these, these orders that are, they've been created in these sites they've created to be executed uh, in real time on a, on a, um, when we serve ads. So what we do is we take this, we run some ETL scripts and, and have some, some messaging and basically generate a flattened structure of this where we basically collapse this tree and then just store things by a, an ID with some columns. So basically, we take the unit ID as the key, we can store information about it, and we can roll up to the site ID and the account ID, and we basically store everything up the tree for that um, particular object. It does create a lot more rows, but because lookups uh, by the unit ID are basically over one, um, the latency is very low, and that's it's important for us to optimize latency over, over storage. So disks are cheap, um, but time is not. So it's one of the things that we do to flatten these things so that the lookups are quicker. Um, Hive is another solution we use for, for data warehousing. Uh, we have over, right now, about 300 or so terabytes of data online. Uh, and we add probably two or three a day uh, in data. So we, we run a 300 node new grid to process that um, and also store it. And then we use a custom binary log format, which is an open source uh, system we wrote for the system. And our, our grid gets pretty heavy usage by, um, by economists and mathematicians and other researchers that we work with. Uh, for example, like this, we're doing a work with a CERF program here at Caltech, which is some undergraduate researchers that come in. They, they're, they're not familiar with Java, much less MapReduce, but they do know it's SQL. So we can say, here, here's an SQL-like interface, and here's 300 terabytes of data. You know, go see what you can find in terms of you know market liquidity and you know sort of opportunities for our customers, and so we can basically take people that are more familiar with a very ubiquitous interface and then give them access to big data basically. Uh, and so for our scientists, analysts, people like that, it's it's very useful for them because they can go in there and not have to bother the developer to say, hey, can you give me access to this data? We're not going to try and email around you know 30, 30 terabyte emails or anything like that. So uh, it lets them have access and they can run their queries and get back the results and look at things. And usually they'll feed it into something like R uh, or if they can afford it, SAS or something like that. Um, Facebook advertising works very similar. They use a system called Scribe, which logs everything you do on Facebook. 
um, surprise, surprise. And then uh, they use that to do you know, targeting of advertisements and things like that. So um, the, they're actually the, the originators of the Hive project. And there's MySQL. I know this is a NoSQL talk, but I still want to talk a little bit about how we use MySQL just to give some perspective about how it fits into the overall um, picture. We use MySQL for, for our highly dimensional reporting. Um, so our data gets partitioned by, by date, but then sharded by customer. And that's because we don't necessarily do joins across customers. Um, if we do that, we do it on the grid, on the, the new grid, using Hive. We say, hey, I want to see you know, what's the average frequency of users across all of our clients. That's going to be a really big query that we're going to run on the new. But if it's just like a canned report, uh, we're never going to do uh, a report. We're not going to show another customer someone else's reports. We're just always going to show them their own report. So we're, we're able to shard uh, the data by customer to different machines, but then within those MySQL daemons, we then partition it by date. So that way we can, you know, if we need to reload a, a week or a, a day of data, we can do that without disrupting the rest of the data. And in, in MySQL 5.1, you can do joins across partitions, but not, not across shards. Um, that would require your own custom query planner. Uh, we do multiple replicas for high availability, so if you know hardware dies, machines die, all that stuff happens. So we just keep a lot of replicas. Uh, use MySAM because there's no need for transactions. When you're just doing read-only reporting. We load dimensions and batch from our from our old CP system, that whole tree structure that we have there, and uh, generate circuit keys and some other things for uh, to track dimensional changes. And then the facts get loaded from a Hadoop uh, grid. So the Hadoop grid generates these pre-partitioned, uh, basically. Um, kind of like uh, tab-separated files, and then we're able to load them basically in batch into, into MySQL and load into a given partition, and then, then basically the data is live. And then using some tricks with like views and stuff like that, you can do it without anyone really noticing. And this is basically how AdWords reporting works. Um, and we have some, some uh, Google employees that work with us that uh, work on that, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's basically it. So in terms of conclusion, um, you know, there's a lot of hype around NoSQL. I think, but I think databases are still very much alive and well. I just think it's more of a Swiss Army knife than really like a, you know, this will solve my MySQL will solve all your problems. It will solve a lot of problems, but it won't necessarily solve everything. And I think NoSQL gives some additional features, uh, scale, clustering, performance, uh, at ex the expense of some functionality. So I think. If you are faced with a uh, decision point as to what to choose, you should think through the different features that each system can provide for you. As you noticed, we use a lot of different NoSQL systems. We don't use Cassandra or Hadoop for everything. We use a, a combination of things because we have different needs. Some things are more latency sensitive, that hey, you know, you have 50 milliseconds to decide, so you have to do that. Or hey, you know, you have 300 terabytes of data. Um, you have to use something different. Um, and then in a lot of cases we do use MySQL because it's, it's great for dimensional reporting and a lot of other things that we need, transactions, stuff like that. Uh, that's basically it. Mm -hmm. Questions? I understand you guys use uh, Amazon's cloud to run your uh, cluster. How has that experience been? Because one of the things that reading about Hadoop that uh, I forget who it was, but one of the contributors said in the early days was, if you want your data to be safe, you can't use the cloud. Um, so if I speak uh, freely, then I might, might not be able to broadcast this, but uh, our, uh, our journey with Amazon has been a long one. Uh, they're, they're certainly a great partner of ours. We're probably one of the top 10 largest users on the, on the cloud right now with the, the you know, the Hadoop grid and other stuff we run probably have thousands of nodes on the cloud. Um, they are, they have come a long way in terms of evolution, um, but, it, you know, again, it's very much a shared service, so there's there's definitely performance concerns and some stability concerns, so one of the things that a lot of these distributed systems force you to do is to assume that nodes fail, because in Amazon EC2 they will fail, and, and they'll fail often. We probably lose any, um, a single digit percentage of our nodes every week, maybe two or three percent will just die and disappear. Sometimes they'll come back, but by then, you know, these, these systems that are doing these pure sort of ring protocols really don't like it when machines turn off, come back, turn off, come back. Because they try and move the data to some other nodes, and then say, oh, it came back, I'm going to move it back, and then it moves it back, and so you just get a lot of thrash uh, of, of things. Uh, as far as safety, um, you know, I don't know if putting something into a physical data center 
versus the cloud data center necessarily just as a cure all for, for security. Obviously, security is a very deep topic. You know, uh, your own data center could get hacked. It's no different than hacking a cloud system. Um, you know, every node in EC2 gets a public IP. You can use IP tables to block you know, things coming in just to make sure it's more of a private thing. Um, you can block, if you use some automation tools that we use, you can block that node from other nodes in EC2 that might be trying to scrape reports or, or figure out you know, what you're doing. Um, Hadoop doesn't provide a lot of security itself. Um, if you can access the name node and a lot of data nodes, you can pretty much access the files on the grid. Uh, so, you know, we tend to use a lot of like network security things, IP tables to, on EC2 IP tables. Um, but now it's going to the point where, economically speaking, we're, we're building our own data centers to, to host these grids, uh, just because it's a lot more cost efficient. You had said that uh, the NoSQL infrastructure is really good for single car. Some of the solutions are good for single machines. Um, so does that mean that that'd be a good solution as opposed to like MySQL for like still storing like an entertainment, like an like a home entertainment server, mm -hmm. where you could you know have all your music files and like your video files? And like yeah. Um, yeah. There's it, it depends on the nature of the data. Uh, if again, if you're doing like a key value lookup. So take a, you know, a Tokyo cabinet, for example. Um, the performance on that will be an order of magnitude faster than MySQL, just because you're losing a lot of the features that a relational database would give you in exchange for a much simpler data format. So you can get you know millions of writes a second on some of these systems on a, on a pretty beefy machine. Uh, if you're doing an embedded application, then sometimes that can make a big difference, like on a mobile device or a set-top box where you're limited to some small ARM process or something like that. Um, and then, you know, but if you do need SQL, sometimes you can use something like SQLite, which is just as good, uh, especially if you don't need to open up the database to the network uh, and you're just doing something, you know, locally. Uh, sometimes that can work well. So it kind of depends. You just, we tend to just take everything that could work and benchmark it uh, and then say, like, oh, well, it's just compare the things. So, like, for Tokyo Cabinet, that's one way that that's good is uh, if you're doing uh, counters on a machine, you know, you need something and you need a lot of processes to, you know, to synchronize somehow with some sort of counter, uh, then you can increment the counter and then read from it. And it doesn't have, you know, the locking and other sorts of things. Yeah. How many of the NoSQL uh, libraries of the ground allow you to have multiple keys? Um, a very few of them, to be honest, because a lot of them are key value. Um, like Tokyo Cabinet, if you use like a B-tree layout, you can have multiple keys. Um, but it take like Cassandra can't, uh, Redis can't. Hadoop is not really a key value store, so you can put whatever you want in there. It's just a file system with MapReduce on top of it. Um, trying to think what else. Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on the system, but a lot of them are sort of key value based, um, especially the sort of distributed hash table kind of things. They're, you know, they're basically rings, and the, the key space is what's used to map the data to the node, and they use a consistent hashing algorithm. So if you have any collisions in that space, then it tends to be pretty bad. So, hello, uh, keys. Now, what people do sometimes is they have a surrogate key, and then they have like a Sandra will have a column family which has multiple values underneath that key. Oh. And then that's and then you can run um, queries against the, those those columns. So you can still access the data, um, but the actual key itself can't be. Um, any particular debugging tricks or tools that uh, you use a lot in this kind of environment? Um, and, for instance, like you were saying it kind of specifically, you kind of go on second time and stuff like that, how do you find that stuff? So, um, maybe the performance aspect. Yeah, for timing, um, we, we created an open source library called ModDemand, which lets you fire events, I think Jeremy can explain, um, which lets you fire events and basically instrument the calls. So we know, like, hey, how long reads, reads and writes take. 
Um, so you instrument the, because it's open source, you can download it, you can patch it, and you can have it fire events. Um, and these are based on like UDP packets that contain timing information and sort of instruments your code. And then you have these listeners which figure out like how long these things take. Um, and then uh, we use like a, I mean, Cassandra has a JMX console. So they run little demons on each of the Cassandra nodes and those things fire events which basically say, hey, here's how much heap I'm using, here's how much my read latency is, average read latency, and then we monitor those things. Um, you know, when, when memory starts to creep up or, you know, read volume creeps up, then we add more nodes basically. And things start to rebalance. What was the name of the album source library? For monitoring? Yeah. Uh, mon demand. Mon demand. It's on source forge. Yeah, Jeremy. I was curious if you could give a quick comparison of Cassandra and Voldemort and is Dynamo available or is that only the iPhone and the Amazon? You know, never Dynamo was written at PowerSet, which then got sorted up by Microsoft and the project kind of died okay. after that. Um, yeah, PowerSet got so Dynamo there's there's Apache's Okay, you know what? I'm wrong. Uh, uh, Amazon wrote a system called Dynamo, and that's what powers uh, S3 and some of their old, uh, their AWS systems, basically. Then PowerSet wrote a thing called Dynamite, okay. uh, which was done in Erlang. And PowerSet was like a natural language search engine company. It got swept up by Bing or Microsoft, and, and then the, the project kind of got stale. Um, and then Voldemort was built at LinkedIn, and it's very similar to Cassandra. There's some differences, but to be honest, like I've only really worked heavily with Cassandra. We we went to a NoSQL meetup about two years ago, and uh, sort of went through some of these different systems, and we ended up using Cassandra partially because um, there's a lot of uh, other users out there so to work with, and so um, we interface with a lot of the, the other developers. Yeah, that's that's all I've seen is that Cassandra sort of got the early momentum and. Everything I've seen says, well, Voldemort is like Cassandra, but doesn't have the the community behind it. And it's yeah. sort of self fulfilling. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how these things happen. Um, so, it, Cassandra's original version came out of Facebook, so obviously they put a lot of load behind it. Um, and then at some of the NoSQL meetups, um, there's folks from. So, the ones that we know about, like Dig, we work with those guys, Twitter used to work tweets. Um, simple Geo uses it for geolocation data. Um, Rackspace was a big investor, and I'm not really sure what they're using it for. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of momentum and people in you know, Cassandra, and, and yeah. uh, a lot easier to get help when you're like, hey, this thing's not working. You write the list, and someone actually is replying. Uh, Voldemort, I think LinkedIn is probably their main user. I don't know of any other major heavy users. Um, and they've actually considered What's Erlang? Erlang is a, a language that uh, is very good at concurrency. So it's a functional language that came out of Ericsson. Uh, it's used to power their telecom switches. And uh, it's uh, similar to the syntax is similar to Prolog. I don't know. It's a pretty old language. Uh, it's a lot of fun to write. Okay. It's a robot language. Any of these products differentiate themselves from the others based on your expected uh, read-write mix? Um, performance, lots of write, writes versus lots of reads? <laughs> yeah, um, so there's a couple things we look at. One is the size of the ex expected size of the data set. So if you're expecting to have a, a data set that's going to fit into your main memory, let's say it's, you know, the servers these days can have 24 gigs of RAM. So let's say it's like 10 gig data set. Not that big, in relatively speaking. So for something like that, we would probably consider something like Redis, where it's just going to load entirely into the, the memory of the machine, especially if the data is mostly read-only. Then we're just going to load it into every machine, so every every single machine has a copy of the data, and just read locally. Now, if you're dealing with order of magnitude larger data, like we do with our user data, where you're talking about you know three, four terabytes, you're, it's not practical to buy that amount of RAM. So you, you basically have to cut the data set into smaller pieces and put them on different machines. Um, and since we're doing heavy sort of write and read 
throughput on those guys we use Cassandra. Hadoop, uh, you know, it's not going to be a real-time system. It's going to be more of a batch kind of offline system. But it's, if you're dealing with another order of magnitude larger, like you're dealing with terabytes or petabytes of data, then you're going to want to use uh, like a Hadoop because just doing things in parallels is going to be a lot faster than trying to run a Perl script on that. It's going to take forever. Um, trying to think what other things. If you're doing something that's constrained to one box, you might use a more embedded system. Uh, yeah, it just kind of depends. Do they have different rules about, I'm not that familiar with Keystore, do they have different rules about uh, the um, granularity of the locking uh, in, in doing reads and writes? Yeah, a lot of them don't do much locking. Um, just because they're they're trying to optimize to sort of different dimension. Um, and they, they, they relax a lot of the, the atomicity, so there's no there's no two-phase commit, for example. It's just like, you write it, it's there. You know, as soon as I return, I've got it. Um, some of them let you control conflict resolution algorithms. So if I have a conflict, take the latest. If I have a conflict, you know, do something else, log something, give up, you know, uh, get some choice there. Uh, again, with the the read and write forums, you can specify how many nodes in a cluster you want to receive the update before it returns back to you. So you may do something where I have a um, replication depth of three, so I have three copies of all my data. And if you do like a um, say, well, I want three nodes to get the data before you know you return back to me, then it will or all you say, I have to make sure that all the data is flushed to all the nodes before you return back, then it will basically lock or block until it gets all written. What's the largest record size that you typically be using? Record size? Yeah. Uh, for like a user system or like in general? Um, so we, we generate different kinds of records. We have records that are relevant to users, like how much data we store for a user that can be probably at, uh, still in the kilobytes, like 3 or 400k, but times 100 million users and that's a lot. Um, then you get information about uh, about inventory orders, so information about you know ads and stuff like that, about targeting. And things like that pulse attention is pretty small. And there's information about ads that have been viewed or interacted with. That also tends to be you know 10, 20k at most. Um, so we deal in advertising. We deal with a lot of micro transactions because every time someone uses a page, uses an ad, there's data generated. We don't deal with necessarily large transactions. Um, and then in aggregate, they end up being big. So you add up, you know, a billion of the big views of the deal. Yeah. This is not really um, NoSQL related, but your, your Hadoop Hive, you said you had hundreds of nodes and hundreds of terabytes. How is the locality balance between the disks and the nodes? Um, so Hadoop or HDFS, uh, to be more specific, lets you control the um, locality of the data. So let's take Amazon EC2, for example. Um, there's availability zones. So this is how we use it in Amazon. We put a third of the nodes in one zone, a third of the nodes in another zone, a third in another zone. And then we basically tell Hadoop, these you know, 100 nodes are in this zone, these 100 are in this zone, these 100 are in this zone. Because it has happened where an entire zone will go black because power outage or someone pulled out a cable. Um, so we, we spread the nodes up that way. We tell Hadoop about that. And we basically say, set your replication factor to three or four, which basically means I want each of those, those zones to have a copy of all the blocks in the system. And Hadoop basically takes your, it, your files, cuts them up into small pieces, sprays them out, and with a, rep, with a replica factor of three, it's going to make sure that you have a copy in every, every one of those zones. So basically, whatever data you have, you have to triple the amount of storage, local storage you need in exchange for the redundancy. Because um, then we've had, you know, zone die, the two zones struggle, they, they start scrambling to move data around to, to compensate for that. The zone comes back up, it moves data back, it's, it's not pretty. But um, at least service can continue and things keep going uh, uh, without you know, anyone, hopefully no one, no one really knows, except the engineers. Since this is a Linux user group, I guess it's obligatory. Um, is there a particular distro you guys prefer? Go to Fedora or 
Uh, yeah, we run on, on CentOS 5. Um, it's harsh, it's old. Yeah, we're, we're anxiously awaiting CentOS 6 or even L6. Um, but it, uh, it's pretty commercial, commercially friendly. A lot of our developers use Ubuntu on the desktop. Or, um, but as far as like production deployments, old and stable is, is fine. We don't really need bleeding edge stuff. So for this purpose, at least for no scale, we don't really need to do much kernel tuning or anything like that. Uh, we still do some of that. Um, like for Cassandra, for example, some of our Cassandra clusters we use we use solid state drives because for systems where you have very sparse data and a lot of random access reads, doing all this, the seek time is going to kill you basically. And with SSD, you get next to zero seek time, so all the random access writes you know won't work really well. So we do a lot of benchmarking, uh, and then there's there's kernel parameters. We want to do like kernel. We're, we're a small company. We don't have the resources to do extra kernel hacking. But we do, you know, tuning of various things. So the SSD, buffer time. The SSD is on a piece of theory, right? There. No, no. Yeah. So, so it's part of what design. sort of um, process are you using? Uh, on our own data center, or in? Yeah. Most of the time we use ext 3 Just ext 3 yeah. We're not, uh, a lot of it's being small enough time to play with CFS or other processes. Um, so yeah, most of the time we just Which uh, JVM, are you guys just using the uh, Oracle Sun JVMs? Yeah, whatever the latest uh, JK6 is. Uh, we tend to be a little slow on updating it, just because the most recent updates tend to be a lot of garbage collection changes. And that changes, when you're doing a lot of memory churning, it changes a lot of things. So pretty careful to uh, upgrade the JDK very carefully, because your heap, your heap sort of graphs change rapidly. Not as bad as like JDK 1.3 or something like that. Uh, it's still pretty dramatic. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, 
response out of it. Yeah. We, we picked around a bunch of ideas for that. Unless we know what, what you want, what we need to want more we need to use. And we're just going to give you what we want. Yeah. Yeah. Did you keep track of those? I didn't. I'm forgetting that. It's not good. I'm getting old. Somebody wrote them down. Oh, oh. Yeah, somebody somebody wrote, wrote them down. Who wrote them down last time? I don't know. I ended it. Oh, she did? But she's out of the country, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's next month's topic? It's a good question, Tom. We have that one. Yeah, I was talking about it. Aros, the amigo has um called me whatever. I can get the uh the floor guy offered to talk about floor thirteen at some point. The what? what floor is it? thirteen? Oh for door. Anyone? I thought you said floor thirteen. Yeah. <laughs> you said that? See that that free time to come up with a new one. Yeah, we'll go, we'll get that offer every time. Sure you showed up more than once, you remember. Actually, this is my second time. So. Yeah. Well, uh, Randall Shorts, the Carl guy, he's in LA almost two to three weeks a month now because he's working for a client downtown. And he does come to Pasadena every now and then to visit one of his friends here. And um, I think if we instead of his extended invitation or something, he did once, I think, talk at Sherman Oaks or something. He talked regularly at LA Co-Mongers. Yeah. Yeah. If we're interested, I, I work at his client. I could fix in the invitation for him. I think we're interested. Okay. I'll, I'll see what he says. Oh, so you the pearls? Small talk. Mm -hmm. She has, I think, a Git um, talk that he gives at Freedom I think that will be the easiest. Uh, well, he'll, he'll, he'll try to pitch small talk before Pro 6. Or uh, <laughs> big small talk. Yeah. He's part of the board. That's, that's that's the board. That's who, who, who is this? What's the name of the group? For that. Randall Schwartz. Randall Schwartz is one of the old time. He's, and it's strangely <laughs> enough, like, going to user group meetings in LA, there is another guy who's in the, in the, in the small talk. So. <laughs> and then you ask him what he does, he says on his ballpark. And he's hard for him. Right? Like, who is that? No, we, we have a group on campus. Yeah, I believe you. More than one person. I believe you. I just, like, every time I, like, when I first, when you first said that, I was like, really? Really? What are they using small talk for? They're using the squeak, it's uh, like the web framework for small talk. Yeah, you gave a talk at scale on that. <laughs> Okay, there's a philosophy you can um, podcast on speed. Is that uh, this week in fact? Yeah, it's on Twitter too. Yeah. Now. Actually, it's on the shorts and stuff. Alright, I got some news. I mean, now people just need to follow up on them. Uh, <laughs> as, as I always say, unfortunately, so people stop playing, saying things. I'm going to try harder not to say it. Everyone comes up with a good idea, I say, okay, you're in charge of doing that. And that doesn't work, <laughs> but it's really true. And as I said, functional anarchy. I uh, would try. It's a duocracy, man. Duocracy. An idea. So, again, if there's something you want to hear about, want to talk about, we're here. Get them. Try and get them to show up. It works. Not that they go quite crazy. You know. Big game. It's a one. And then they murder people. And Bad things happen. Um, uh, Can I ask another question, Michael? Yeah. Did you guys have any particular wrong terms, well, not any solutions, any real uh, hard learned lessons? A um, couple, couple times we do a little kind of like over engineering sometimes. You get a little under, underwhelmed with the volume, so you kind of spend a lot of effort. On building this like system that scales to petabytes of data, and you get like you know, and the business says, oh, we're gonna have five thousand customers, you know, like one or two, <laughs> and then um, you know, you get like a couple megabytes of data. It's like I, I spent a lot of time doing a lot of work for for not a lot of uh, benefit. So um, 
we, we use them pretty agile process that we do like two week scrums and stuff like that. So what we tend to do uh, to react to that is kind of engineer kind of for now and then refactor as we go. Um, so sometimes you don't need to build the cost of failure is generally not that high. Yeah, because especially if you're working on you know two week sort of cycles, if you fail in the two week cycle, it's not too bad. You can react um, and then do something else. You know, and, and it gives you some time to, to test and prototype things and benchmark things, and then um, then you decide from there you know what to do. Because sometimes you have to fail a few areas to decide like the right thing to do. And a lot of it's trying to get the other side of the company to buy into that sort of process. Like, hey, we need a month to do it because we need two weeks to mess around. And then we're not just kind of goofing around. We're trying to test things. And then in the last two weeks, we can figure out what we actually do. What percentage of your two-week cycles hit their targets in the two weeks? Um, like half. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually. And then you generally just push it into the next two weeks? or what's that? Yeah. We, you know, it's, it's, it's not really an exact figure, but we, Everything is prioritized. The so product managers prioritize things. We basically just start from the top and work down. So you get down as far as you can. So when I say 50%, it's like, well, usually at the beginning of the sprint, I'll draw a line saying I think this is about where we're going to finish. So I guess I haven't been very accurate about it. But um, you know, we get through some stuff, and then there's some stuff left over. And we basically do the prioritization all over again. So sometimes there's things that are persistently there every month. Because it's just like there's new stuff comes up, and so it ends up there. And it's like, well, I still want to do this, but only if we get time. Um, so it's just a constant juggling game. Yes, you know, it, it's disorienting some people because like, well, why don't you plan? It's like, well, we plan every two weeks. Yeah. That's all we do. We need two whole weeks for now. It's not one. <laughs> okay. I don't think I can handle one. It's too many meetings. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem to be a long to explode right now. Um, uh, Anyone else here have a Caltech address? If you haven't already, please get an account so we can get the uh, Caltech cal uh, calendar updated. I sent the submission for this for tonight's meeting last week. And it didn't get published until today or this afternoon. So it'll be good to have some redundancy so that Subin Elders, well, the topic's going to be taken. So long as the health ship is possible. I was on vacation. <laughs>
all you do is go to groups.drupal.org slash LA slash events and you can see it. And there we go. I mean I was in Santa Barbara yesterday. You should put some of those links on the website. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll put some of the links that I talked about now on the list. Any other announcements? Sure, question. Mm -hmm. um, what are people doing for archiving, publishing their pictures? Are you going through an off-site website? I've got like several desktop clients at home on a social file server. And every time I buy a new laptop or computer, everything just gets copied over. The old one is the state and time as it was then. <laughs> you want something online, you said? Not just what online, but what I want to be able to do is, you know, I started playing with Picasa. I really like the ability to for it to recognize pictures, but I don't know is all the for me all the metadata for the pictures and stuff for face recognition is that stored with each individual directory or some machine on each individual desktop. So if I then pop up a browser on another desktop in the house, is it going to have the same piece information? Or do I have to somehow manually replicate it or what? Can you use something like F-Shot? That's an open source one, right? But will it uh, easily let me share the data on the file server on my clients? Oh, I don't know. I've never used it. YouTube doesn't like it. Oh yeah, yeah. Ubuntu changed their default image program to something else that's not .NET or mono-based, whatever. Ubuntu's getting rid of all their mono-based apps for the next release as the default. And I got rid of. Ubuntu uses apps too complicated. And use Ubuntu Java server at home. It's not a default default. There's maybe a, a basic question, but does anybody know how to be able to get um, facebook.com slash subdomain and use it? Do you have to pay or something? Or how does that work? Yeah. Besides, I checked the Facebook the first time a few days ago and I thought if you. It's in your account profile. Pardon me? It's in your account profile. You can. I couldn't find it. I mean, so I mean, anybody can get the subdomain they want? I think it's first come first serve. I mean, yeah, I guess uh, uh, something. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's like your name. alias or something like that. They're, they're called vanity vanity URLs in Facebook, mm -hmm. and they started making them available. I think like last March, June, I want to say. But it's basically like you could you could have Facebook.com backslash Mike Parker. So, so, so no so, one else. So it's in the menu. Yeah. I can find it. That's why it's so hard. Whatever you create, so, it'll actually, if you create your user account, it'll actually create that as your bank account, it's not taken away. So right. you need to so verify your account via you know, phone, like, 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 like the SMS or something. You need to do that before you get that feature. And do you know, has anybody like tried sign up for Google Voice? I have it. Yeah, yeah so do I. I have my phone actually. What? Yeah, I know, but it's funny thing is that the, uh, like, I mean, it's bizarre. Like, a um, few times it does just signs me in into the the Google Voice account without the phone number. That's probably but a few times. Yeah. One of the like seven times I tried, it asked asked me for some number to verify, as if it's about to give you the number. When I read the Google Voice help, it sounds like. You're supposed to be able to have a choice to get a uh, Google number or use your real number. But like uh, six out of seven, that screen kicks me right into quote unquote some sort of a Google Voice account without any number. While when I click the help on it, it says I'm supposed to have some number next to the Google ID. It's very strange. I, I try many different computer and it seems random. I'm, I don't know, but it was a Spanish telemarketer called me once and I got this text message that was impossible to read because it just didn't translate text to speech. <laughs> it, it does have issues with, with uh, accents. So you didn't have a problem with that, right? Does anyone use Google Prediction? The, uh, and they have the wrong name, but they have the prediction library. Has anyone done any data mining with that or any other libraries? 
You should do it and give us a talk. Two <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Maybe we should change it. The duocracy. You do it. Just do it. Um, um, the only other thing I was going to ask is, um, who was asking about the Android phones last week on the mailing list? That was Matt Campbell. Oh, He's standing right now. Right I was saying, I noticed someone mentioned you, he even when I got this last week, and I was say yes, this one is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> is the battery life okay once you stop playing with it? Uh, actually, even it depends on what you're doing while you're playing with it, because I've had some some nights where I'm on it like, you know, four hours or so, and I'm like, oh wow, the battery's starting to get low. And, you know, I think it was last, this past weekend, I forget what I was doing, and I was on there like all day Sunday, I think, and I think I was on there a good like eight hours, and just messing around with it constantly online, and I think I would use like half the battery, so it all depends. Yeah, the, the screen sucks the, the the battery dry. The screen? Yeah. I, I haven't, like I said, I haven't really noticed too much. Actually, I mean, even for um, July 4th, um, so I, it, I, I recorded the fireworks. It's probably I'd love to do with, if you have a set, what well, you have your brightness set at. If you have, it, like, you make, it makes a massive difference if you set it for like auto brightness and you're outside. It, 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 it did. actually runs a lot like lower light level when you're in a bright room. Wait. No, 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 it's the other way around. When the sun's out, it's brighter. Yeah. Anyways, it makes a difference, too. So, I guess while I was spending all my time in the cave, maybe that was... <laughs> <laughs> that helped me prolong my battery life, I don't know. Yeah. When well, I heard that Apple finally uh, admitted the fact that they got the calculations wrong for how many bars of reception you have? <laughs> well, it's not that they got the calculation wrong, necessarily. They just wanted a higher number. Probably just I, just us. I have been in the back room of a cell phone manufacturer watching them tweak that number up because the competitors' bars were more than theirs. And they <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a big factor. Um, well, somebody pointed out, like, right after that whole thing, when people figured out that like, they messed up their antenna design, there were three, like, uh, antenna design engineer positions open at Apple. <laughs> <laughs> So either somebody got fired, or uh, they said, maybe we should spend more time on that. Um, so. What I was going to say is, um, I heard they're going to be releasing a software patch soon for uh, what someone's iPhone actually lit on fire from the USB port. They have a patch for that. Too. They have an app for that <laughs> not, not yet, but they're working on it. They're working on it. But yeah, I think I was like a couple days ago, I, I forget what I read it on them. Like the bottom connector, somehow there's. The, all they used was the I, the iPhone connector to USB cable. And like, I guess they're charging off their computer or whatever, and it lit on fire at the phone. Jeez. Well, since there's no other option of charging your iPhone at all, um, I would assume that the, I mean, because it comes with an iPhone to USB. Well, yeah, it was the factory little, one. Little thing that plugged into the wall. Yeah. There's no other options for charging your iPhone. Well, actually, these things. I know, that kind of annoys me about it. Is, am I the only one who is like, annoyed by, like, I kind of like the, the whole dock connector thing on the iPhone. That's the only thing that I kind of like about I, it. Like, I hate docks. I just, I love being able to just... I would like to be able to dock my phone in a car. That's my only, like, point in, the, in it. Like, that would be nice. Actually, like, the one thing I would like to plug a USB cable to it, like, that would be nice a little bit. Because what, what was the Android phone that came with the Google navigation, with the first one? The Garmin. Or not do, no, no, no. Probably the next one. I mean, I have it on my phone. Yeah, yeah. It came with it came with magnetic car mounts that would you know as soon as you docked your phone onto it, it would open up navigation, turn into yeah. GPS mode. But what I've always wanted is I wish all the phones did that. But beyond that, is that they managed to integrate that touchstone technology into it. The Droid was the first one, I think, and it had, came with a dock. Actually. Well, this thing has it because of the HDMI. Yeah, it's got HDMI. Wow. Like that. What's the video that actually look like on HDMI? I haven't bothered with it, but I get the most oohs and ahs whenever I had to do this. It's just like, oh yeah, well mine's got a kickstand. And then I was like, what about iPhone 4, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, kickstand. <laughs> that thing, like, I, don't care. <laughs> I don't understand why it took so long to put that on the phone. Like, <laughs> put that on the phone. It's an ingenious, stupid little thing that makes, that is so awesome. It's like, like if you're going to watch video on it, what do you do all day? You sleep and stand like this. All day. Right? That's what you do. It's, it's like, fix me. Right? Like, oh, I, I made the Verizon guy so ticked when my girlfriend went in to uh, look at her upgrade options. 
And he's like, oh, so what are you doing with your phone? And I'm like, I just got this a couple days ago, and it's far superior to every single phone in here. You know, there's, and, the, uh, there's another... And they're like, oh, yeah, prove it. Kickstand. <laughs> <laughs> There's another HTC phone that has a kickstand, right? Like, it's like I haven't seen them. Well, actually, maybe planned, but I haven't seen them yet. Actually, I think there's another one that does. I mean, I'm sure they've got a patent for it somehow. So. I, they don't. Yeah, it's, it's, I, they don't have a patent on it. Like, well, it's not entirely a phone, but like, I bought this uh, Android tablet. And it's got a kickstand. So. Uh, well, that, that's more practical. I mean, big. Nice. <laughs> Actually, they have an app for that. I noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? Is it big enough to be usable? I have not played with it enough. I left it in my bag at work for a week and totally forgot about it. And I just remember that it was in my bag because I left my bag at work for a week. So, one thing that was um. What? What is that? What? What is that? Uh, it's the Arco Seven Internet Tablet. So it doesn't have, it's like got 8 gigs on board and a mini SD slot. Um, Which version is on? Which version? So it's like an iPad only cool. one. It's like five or six, I'm not sure. It's, it's very unclear about that and it's very non-specific. And it, all it has is a firmware version. So it has their build version and it they kind of like doesn't expose what the Android version is. The only other complaint I had was it doesn't charge off USB. Um, which is like ridiculous. What the hell? Did I one five do the different screen sizes? What? Did one uh, did one five handle the, that's the screen sizes? Uh, what? See, the thing is, Android can handle anything because it's open source, so you can. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, the yeah, device yeah. manufacturer can like pretty much like one five didn't support CDMA. I have a CDMA phone that came with one five, so it's it's perfectly possible to do things because it is open source. You have they actually have the entire stack. They can build it. They can they can put in what they want. The device manufacturer can put in what they want, um, and the battery. Another announcement. Def Con is July 28th, uh, 29th through August 1st. Very good chance. Yeah. I say it's good. And isn't aren't they having like an Amazon AWS conference in LA July 20th? I just can't remember. I know it's being hosted at Softcell on the website, but I can't remember the URL of who's going to get it. I'm assuming Amazon. I heard about that. And they're still taking submissions for me this time. <laughs> Again. Cool. Well, I would say Bird Continental. I was just going to give you the heads up. Uh, I submitted my article to Linux Journal on Braddix. Braddix on the Radix 8-bit computer, and I included a little plug link slash to stblog.org. So if your boss blows up, you guys don't want to hear it. I don't think it'll blow up, but I don't think it will. My DSL line, I may not be able to use my DSL, and I may be able to use my DSL, but it won't work What? 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 That that could definitely that looking at my program guide will definitely blow up the box. Because uh, yeah, that's not optimized very well. I always look at that and go, they did not do a good job of this. I think it got way too much data in this database or it's not indexed in some stupid way. I don't know if it was just because of my work DNS, but SGBLUBUD.com didn't dissolve, but or of course it was just fine. I don't know if we were doing it on my We don't own com. Okay. Oh we did. My bad. Oh, it was available, right? Was what? How did it happen? It was coming available, or was it? We own net and word. Yes. I don't know about mom unless somebody bought it, but I don't know. That was a mistake. I guess I should have tried that. Now, truthfully, uh, it was offline a couple of times because uh, this month, because my. I've been to be twice in a row, so it was kind of a, you know, my UPS had died, and so it didn't. I, my router, did, my OpenWRT router did not have. UPS and it has a nice feature that if it can't boot, it goes back to factory defaults. Uh -huh. But if power fails and then comes back and fails again very quickly, it can that can look like that can look like uh, it was unable to boot. Um, so I lost all the settings twice to the and then there was a weekend when I ordered a new router when I ordered a new router and then it was like 
configuring a new router, completely new version of stuff that worked completely differently. So uh, there was some there was some offline time. A couple of you guys emailed me, hey, uh, things aren't resolving. <laughs> things are broken. Um, should be better now. Which router did you go with? Um, uh, it was a Buffalo one. It was a pretty cool router. Well, oh, another one the DDWRT ones. What? Another one that supports DDWRT. Obviously. Yeah, um, it, it's pretty cool because you know it's got gigabit ports and and well, it does a lot more stuff than my old router. It has 64 megs of RAM and 32 megs of storage. It's pretty yeah, that's what I was looking at. There's a net here that does all that too. It's just I don't really feel like it's 950 bucks right now. Say, uh, Rise has their own name branded router now for $20. It's a D-Link, if I remember right. It's actually a rebranded D-Link. Yeah. But, but what's so funny when is when it's you actually... When you open the box, there's a, a GPL statement in the box. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Actually, I think they're supportive of any DDF routes. Maybe one of these times, one of you guys who talked about commercial routers, they have a lot of extra features these days that just don't normally have it. Commercial routers? Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to hear about the, the features on the commercial routers. Okay. Load balancing and the, the other things. Uh, yeah. It's all in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Should talk about that. Bureaucracy, though, and I've been doing way too much for work, so doing stuff for this. Is just as a check, how far in advance are the uh, if the load domains paid for? That's a good question. Uh, Madi owns them and pays for them, so I'm not sure. Uh, it was, I mean, these days it's cheap. Yeah, it's a bunch. Yeah, so, um, um, they reduced the years, though, the amount of years that you can have it for. I think they, like, three years now. It used to be, like, 10, 15 years. Okay. Well, some some of them are actually increasing. Like .dot com is slated to have an increase in price or in how long you can register. No, in price. Yeah, he was talking about how long you can right. register. Right. Well, he said they were cheap now, but they're oh, yeah. they're getting less cheap. Yeah. Yeah, because I think I pay like two bucks a year. <laughs> that wouldn't that be? A, isn't that a violation of the terms of the service of the domain? We don't have porn. <laughs> well, with the wiki, I mean, it depends on your. It depends on your <laughs> no, 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 it's not. No, no, no. So, okay, I'm just, I'm just pointing out that like uh, when the when the dot mobi domain came out, they're very specific about you had to have mobile content on the domain. That's all they could be there. I just made the assumption if they're going to make a triple X domain that you require so. that you have porn on your domain name. Oh, would, you, would you would you define human. porn? <laughs> <laughs> I know it when I see it. Naked human beings. Naked human beings. That's all I don't know. You're so narrow-minded. I know. <laughs> this Sorry. is a nice piece of porn right here. You know, it's, it's done it, you know? Is that the kickstand? Oh, the kickstand. I'm telling you, man, this thing is just, I mean, look at that. I don't know why it took so long to, like, put a kickstand on it. Like, That's amazing. Oh. It's like, like, that would be awesome because, like, I could put it, like, on my desk. I could set my phone there and, like, I could actually look at it. Well, for me, it's like I get to look at my Sudoku things sideways. So, it's... It's what happens when you let adults, like, design things. They probably put it in the hands of kids to get, like, I think they're, like, little samples. <laughs> I, I assumed it was from, uh, from uh, uh, what do they call them, LCD picture frames. Um, yeah. Well, because like, I, I had a Nokia, like a what, N770, the little Linux tablet, and it came with like, it was pretty awesome. I, the kickstand is a way better idea, but it had this little thing that was like these two little pieces of plastic put together and you made a little stand for it, right? But it, you pulled it down and stuck together so you could put it in your pocket. It was pretty horrible. But, and that was pretty awesome for a long time because, you know, you could just put it there and if it plug in, it would leave the screen on and stuff. And it was, it worked well, but just put the kickstand on the thing. It's just, all right. The, this, this is why people, like, 